Good evening, everybody, uh, and welcome to Energy Startup 101, Beyond Innovations. My name is Sam Ori, and I'm the Executive Director of the Energy Policy Institute at the University of Chicago, or EPIC. On behalf of EPIC and our co-hosts for this event, the Polsky Center for Entrepreneurship and Innovation, I want to thank you all for joining us tonight. Uh, I also want to thank our co-sponsors, uh, the Rustandi Center for Social Sector Innovation, the Clean Energy Trust, and Energy Foundry uh, for making this event possible. Now, as an institute, EPIC is obviously focused on policy. Uh, it should be obvious from the name, the Energy Policy Institute. Uh, and we're especially focused on better understanding and ultimately solving what we call the global energy challenge. Namely, uh, how can we assure that soci societies around the world have access to reliable, affordable energy that we all know is needed for growth uh, without putting the environment, climate, or human health at risk? We do this by helping to foster cutting edge economics and policy research across our group of affiliated faculty throughout the university, and then connecting those insights to uh, influencers and policymakers around the world. But I wanted to just uh, make a note as we get started that our focus on policy and economics doesn't mean uh, that we ignore innovation, particularly when it comes to climate change. Technological and business innovation in the, in the energy space are gonna be critical for addressing the global energy challenge. Uh, instead, what we're interested in are ways in which markets and policies can help uh, or can be best structured to incentivize innovation. But that still leaves an important set of questions. One is how do we best get critical innovations from the lab into the marketplace? Uh, and then what are the best financing models? What do young companies need to take off and be successful? What are the risks and pitfalls that are unique to energy? Uh, and how can, those how can those be overcome in a world where the policy framework or policy support is not always complete and not forthcoming? Uh, or as I thought I would put it, uh, the policy response is sometimes less than huge. Uh, these questions are the subject of tonight's discussion, and I really cannot imagine four better people to take us through the issues. Uh, leading the discussion tonight will be Steve Levine, who is the future editor at Axios. Uh, he's also a senior fellow at the Atlantic Council and teaches energy security at Georgetown University. Before this, Steve was a foreign correspondent in the former Soviet Union, uh, a foreign correspondent in the former Soviet Union, Pakistan, and the Philippines. Uh, Steve is joined by Amy Francetic, who oversees the Invenergy Future Fund, a clean tech venture capital firm based here in Chicago. Amy's career spans more than 20 years of high technology entrepreneurship, private equity, and research. Uh, next to Amy is Charles Murray who is president and co-founder of Switched Source, a company focused on providing the next generation of hardware solutions for electric distribution utilities. Uh, and I should mention that uh, Charles is a Booth grad. Um, next to Charles is Manoj Kumar. Manoj is a senior advisor to the Tata Trusts, where in addition to his advisory role, he also owns the executive responsibility for all university and institutional partnerships and manages the innovations in R&D portfolio. He's also the architect and chief evangelist of Social Alpha, an ecosystem stack that aims to provide full lifecycle idea to impact support to social innovators and entrepreneurs. Uh, before we get to the panel and begin the panel, I want to invite uh, Bala Srinivasan to give a few remarks as well. Uh, Bala serves as the interim head of the Polsky Center for Entrepreneurship and Innovation, as well as vice president of the university's Office of Global Engagement. Uh, in his global engagement capacity, Bawa builds academic partnerships and research collaborations with international partners, creates global and education opportunities, and works to strengthen the university's connections to global institutional partners, policymakers, and civic leaders. Bawa brings more than 20 years of experience in international private equity, uh, or international private equity investing to this role. So please join me in welcoming Bawa. Thanks, Sam. Um, welcome to all of you here. Um, welcome to all the panelists, and a special welcome to my dear friend Manoj, who is fortuitously here from far away Mumbai for other work with the Tata Center. We're lucky to have him here today with us. Um, today's event is part of um, the Polsky's Innovation Fest, which is a month-long celebration of the university's pioneering focus on rigorous discovery and entrepreneurial endeavors. The celebration um, encompasses like uh, approximately 30 events, some workshops, and accelerator programs hosted by a cross-section of departments and divisions, and units such as EPIC, highlighting the breadth and the impact of innovation at the university in areas of entrepreneurship and research commercialization, scientific advancement, and social impact. This month-long event culminates um, at the end of the month in the Ed Kaplan New Venture Challenge, which, for those of you who may not know, 
is the number one university accelerator in the country uh, with more than a million dollars in cash prices and in-kind services. Now, the Polsky Center helps startups access capital, identify talent, find space, build prototypes, and plan for growth of their businesses. These services and events demonstrate our investment in ensuring that the new business models and foundational scientific discoveries fuel future innovation in our economy and society and drive the creation of new businesses leading to solutions that can change people's lives. Going forward, another principal focus of the Polsky Center is to expand the resources available to our faculty and community members to facilitate more effective interfaces between the sciences and the world of commercial applications. One important vehicle in the new Polsky, is the new Polsky Center expansion project, which will involve partners such as the UIC, uh, University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, and the Army Research Labs, who will be housed in a 270,000 square foot space on 53rd Street here in Hyde Park, which will serve as a mixed-use complex of both lab space and office space. Turning great ideas into successful companies is a difficult process, but the nature of the difficulty is actually quite different in various vertical areas. What's common to all these companies and ideas is there's an entrepreneur who is tireless and who is persevering in the face of multiple obstacles. The Polsky Center serves as a supportive, informative, and facilitating environment to make dealing with the complexities of new businesses a little more bearable. Now, when you innovate, um, whether it's around business processes, or whether it's for profit or in the social impact area, or whether you innovate to take a new drug or device to the market, or whether you innovate in an energy startup, there are completely different and difficult so-called valleys of death in the process of these companies. Perhaps we in this room as lay people understand more about the difficulties of sales and early adopters of a new business technology, or about the complex FDA project, a process for a new drug or a new device. We understand much less about how this works in the complex and highly regulated energy world. I expect that today's conversations will shed some light on this. The energy industry presents a unique set of challenges around funding, risk, institutional acceptance, and market compliance uh, and comp competition. Today's panelists each represent a different aspect of the energy innovation ecosystem, ranging from funding to incubation to implementation. Before we get started, I'd also like to say a few words about energy innovation from a global perspective. Um, EPIC, that is the Energy Policy Institute of Chicago, represents the university commitment to one of society's most pressing issues, which is understanding how to deliver access to reliable and affordable energy while limiting its social and environmental uh, impacts. Global energy demand is set to grow by almost 40% in the coming two decades, and a large proportion of that growth will occur in the emerging economies of India and China. India is a place where EPIC already has a significant physical presence and a footprint, and China where that is developing along same lines um, as we speak. The university via EPIC is turning its resources to understand how to provide this access to reliable, affordable energy um, in a way that does not put health and environment at risk, and yet respects and uh, keeps sustained um, economic growth in these um, growing areas of the world. Today's panel addresses the on-the-ground challenges of implementing energy innovation, one of the crucial pain, process, uh, pain points in this process. Many thanks to our distinguished panelists for being here today. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Steve Levine to get the conversation started. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's, it's so great to be back here at the, the University of Chicago. Um, I, I'm not sure that, you, that, that all of you realize, I'm sure that Sam realizes that, um, that the, the Institute is one of the two or three very best energy thought leaders in, in the country um, at a time when, uh, when thought leadership is, is under tremendous uh, challenge. And so I congratulate you for doing it in a very short time. Uh, so thanks very much for having me tonight. The, uh, the um, energy space, energy technology space is under uh, uh, great uh, stress right now uh, because of uh, sh shifting politics uh, here in the United States, but elsewhere too, shifting economics. And so the, uh, the actors who are in the field 
attempting to make the innovations like the uh, p panelists that we've pulled uh, t together tonight have a greater challenge even, even than, they, uh, than they had a few years ago, which, which was a lot. So we're, we're going to run through um, all of that. We're going to attempt by the end of the, uh, of, uh, of the time limit to, to uh, deliver as much of a realistic appraisal of where we are <coughs> and what needs to happen to, to, to get to that kind of world that uh, Bala and Sam described at the, at the beginning. So we're going to start with Amy. And uh, Amy, uh, can you give us uh, an impression of what is the U.S. landscape, uh, b both uh, gi giving us a long view, of course, but how, does, how is now distinguished from where we were, say, say two, two years ago? Well, I think uh, it, was, it was very wise that you you and Bala commented on you know, the cost of energy because prices have been so low in oil and gas um, and electricity prices have been relatively low. So that, of course, challenges innovation. There's, um, there's not as much cost structure in the business to invest in innovative solutions, but at the same time, it makes it very competitive, right? So the prices are so low that in order to compete, you have to be smarter and better, and it's harder and harder for, for folks to stand out. So, We've been trying to innovate, especially around clean energy, to make it very, very cost effective. And there has been some tremendous strides in the equipment, um, in wind equipment, in solar uh, cells that have made now wind the cheapest source of resource for electricity that exists. It's beating natural gas in many markets. It's, of course, cheaper than coal and uh, nuclear. And so it's putting pressure on some of these status quo uh, incumbent players in those uh, in those very centralized forms of energy that are now priced out of the market. So it's very hard for nuclear to compete. It's very hard for coal to compete. But what's happened in the last few years is that instead of having maybe the wind at our back that we thought we would have with the Paris Climate Accord and maybe an administration that would have seen that innovation in clean energy as an economic engine for jobs, which it really is. There's tremendous job, job growth happening in the solar industry and the wind industry. Instead, we have an administration that's trying to take us backwards and trying to resuscitate coal and nuclear and trying to um, help them compete uh, in the market where they really are not able to compete today. So that has, I think, curtailed some of the, um, some of the at least federal and, and sort of White House uh, support for innovation. And so industry has had to go about it themselves and try to innovate a little bit on their own. And I think the benefit that we have, maybe without some of the political wins at our back, we have some really tremendous economic wins at our back. And, and that's really what's, what's driving you know, clean energy forward. And we look at, you know, with my fund, with the Inventorship Future Fund, we're looking at digital innovations. So we're looking at how do you innovate then on the margin? With prices being so low now in solar and wind, how can you improve the technology with how you operate it? How do you optimize what we have today to really make it the, um, the default best choice for, for uh, power, not only in the US and around the world? And we're starting to see that happen. It's just, it's just again, some of these political forces that, you know, other, that I think where the US is, is rather standing on their own in the world um, against some of what's happening elsewhere. What is it, let me just follow up, just uh, dig in just just a bit, in, in terms of, uh, let's say where we are is A, and B is, is where we want to be, in your opinion, uh, what is B? I would say B is renewable energy supplying more than 80% of our power needs. And, and, and what is, um, uh, what's stopping uh, us from getting there? Couple, couple of things, so we, if you look at it from a, policy standpoint, there's a lot of competing policies at the state level that are stitching together this very complicated uh, political landscape. Um, so we do have to look for states that are very progressive, states that have strong renewable portfolio standards or other kinds of mandates or requirements for clean power. So states like California are moving forward very quickly in some of these areas. Um, you know, Illinois um, could, could have an even more progressive solution. We have very cheap power here, which is part of the challenge in the Illinois uh, to compete and, and to innovate even more. Um, but we are 
dealing with this patchwork of state solutions, which makes it a little hard for someone who wants to operate nationally to navigate all the different, you know, not only the, the, the state policies, but all the different commissions. The next thing you have is a complex grid infrastructure. So we're blessed with pretty reliable power across the United States, and it takes a lot of effort to supply power and operate that grid very, very reliably. So as you add more and more renewables onto the grid, you stress it out. You stress it out with the intermittency of wind and solar, and so you need some way to address some of that stress, and that comes in the form of transmission investments to, to move power from the places where it's very cheap to produce it to the very congested load centers, but you also need battery storage so you can store power at the most convenient places on the grid. And, and uh, public policy is super Im important. I'm, I'm getting the impression it's not, it's not a totally commercial. Um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, yeah, highly regulated. So yeah, thank you. I mean, this is a highly regulated industry. It's very hard to um, work against policy in this area. And, and the large utilities, which are essentially monopolies, are, um, are doing what the regulations tell them to do. So that's another challenge. They can't really invest. You know, the utilities are investing in areas where they can recover cost for that investment, whether that's equipment or particular kinds of services. So if they can't recover costs for that, they're not necessarily investing to compete against other utilities because there isn't a lot of competition in, in these locations. So they're looking for, you know, they're going to be not leaders, they're going to be followers. They're going to be following what other folks are doing, and they're going to follow when that, you know, solution, you know, provides cheaper power, is something that their customers want and require, and um, has some benefit to the grid, maybe in flexibility. Got it, got it, great. Um, thank you. Manoj, we're going to go to you. Um, so uh, when, when we look ahead over the next decade and a half and two decades um, at global en the, uh, the growth in global energy requirements, the population increase, a lot of that is in India. Uh, and, and, and so the, the, uh, the fear of, uh, of, uh, of th those who watch climate change is, is that a, a lot of that, of that apocalyptic increase in greenhouse gases is forecast to come from in India. India, though, is, is, uh, is on a, a public policy appears to be uh, adopting or at least embracing. Uh, can, can you, can you uh, give us a picture of the landscape? We're going to get a global picture, picture in India uh, of uh, what, how, how, real, how real is that public policy? What's going on? And also you might mention that uh, Tata Trusts, who you're with, uh, uh, you, uh, uh, investing in, in uh, social future, and it's been doing this for 126 years now? Yeah. Yeah. So let me start with with a different perspective of energy. Uh, you know, we look at energy nowadays globally from a global warming, climate change perspective, but energy is also a very important factor in poverty. There are, in India itself, there are about 300 million people who do not have access to electricity, for example. So energy access is also a very big issue in energy innovation, right? So a lot of innovation probably, especially for the developing world, may not be a reaction towards global warming or climate change, but it could be to solve the problem of access, right? Because directly related to access to education, access to healthcare, access to livelihoods for a large number of people. And, and, and that gets neglected in the innovation landscape a lot of times. Uh, and that's what exactly we are trying to do. Uh, we, we, are, we, we are trying to create an ecosystem where innovators can get their ideas to an incubation ecosystem like you have in United States, like in Chicago you have Polsky Center and University and a number of research labs and companies around, around the city. Uh, we really do not have an ecosystem of in innovation labs, incubators, and investors who work in synchronization to take these ideas to market. And, 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 and looking from 
you know, the context of large country like India, uh, where most of the utilities are state run and are not very efficient, you also need a decentralized way of uh, private sector distribution in, in energy, right? So a large number of innovations are required not only on energy generation side, but also on distribution, storage, and consumption side, right? So I'll give you another example uh, that, that impacts access policy uh, and global issues that we can push clean energy to people, but if you are not in innovating on the efficient appliances side, they don't have any incentive to use clean energy or any other source of energy because you need high level of efficiency on the consumption side as well. So if the ceiling fan that I use in my village continues to be an inefficient 60-year-old technology that consumes huge amount of energy, giving me access to solar is not going to significantly change my energy patterns. Uh, so, so there, there is, a, uh, there are com competing uh, interests in in India. One, one is electrifying the lives of those 300 million people, cleaning up the air in Mumbai, Delhi, and elsewhere, um, uh, and 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 and, do you, and and this enormous, even beyond those th 300 million people, the whole country. Uh, we presume over the coming decades is going to move closer to the middle class and, and, and what that means for greater energy use. Um, so, so do we believe the government when it talks about making that shift using clean energy? Yeah, so that shift is visible. Now, if you see uh, government that the federal government in India is now committed to clean energy and the part of the mission innovation. And there has been a large budgetary outlay for promoting innovation. But I think we have a gap between the lab and the market. And that gap needs to be really bridged because uh, it's relatively new, right? And ecosystem is still in, in, an, in, a, in a very evolving stage. So what we need is a nationwide network of incubators, both on technology incubation as well as business incubation side that can help uh, researchers or innovators build solutions. What has historically happened in India, and, and, and apparently in Africa as well, that a large number of companies have built products and they have pushed products for several years. So the microgrid, for example, you know, has been recipient of billions of dollars of investment over years, but I haven't seen significant improvement in energy access, right? People need energy, they don't need microgrid, right? People need clean cooking, they don't need cook stoves. But we are assuming that people need cook stoves and we're pushing this to the market, right? So there is a lot of product push that is happening in this space rather than understanding the needs of community and creating solutions around that. So what we are trying to do, we, are, we just started building a Tata you know, Clean Energy Incubation Center in Delhi, where we are providing innovators and researchers a, a, a facility where they could actually build solutions and test those solutions in, in collaboration with the communities at the grassroots level, iterate it over a period of time. So we are offering them six months to 18 months of incubation period so that they can build solutions which are required for the market. right? refine these solutions and then we have a business incubation model whereby we can provide them seed capital, access to market, access to our large network of NGOs and, and, and channels at the grassroots level so that we build what is needed rather than we push what we have already assumed that the people need it. So th this is a gap that, that we started filling and now the government of India has come on board so they are they're partnering with us so this would be our first incubation center and then we are planning to have five or six more across the country. But we link energy to livelihoods. We don't link energy to just, so it's not about just lighting a bulb in a village. It's about running a barber shop or, or running a water pump, uh, you know, or, 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 or running a school, right? So linking it with education, healthcare, livelihoods, linking it with access issues, uh, 
and then when you link it with access issues, you have to focus on affordability as well as the user experience. So you can, you can take the grid to the village, but that doesn't mean that people start consuming electricity, right? Yeah, well, one more thing in, term, in terms of framing, j just quickly, um, uh, the, the incubation. Um, we, we, we hear again and again, I, over the years, uh, Amy has told me this many times, and, and, and I've heard her say it uh, publicly, um, that the public and investors need to, uh, need to have a, a, a longer uh, range outlook. Their, their appetite needs to, uh, they need to relax and wait be willing to wait five to eight years with their investment, but but you actually think that the that the uh, the waiting period may be longer than that, right? It can be. It can be longer. It it could be more than ten years, right? It could be, you know. Uh, why, can it be and, and why, years? why are we why are we you know again anything that has huge social impact. It, it, uh, connotation actually gets singled out that you know energy or healthcare or education has a long long term investment horizon. We just had an e-commerce com company in India that was acquired by Walmart, and the investors had to wait for 15 years to get exit. Right. Yeah. So it's not, you know. But yes, you know it's, you know in, even in digital space people are not getting exits. Right. So energy definitely requires a much longer investment horizon for two reasons. One, uh, the lab to market ecosystem doesn't exist. Unlike aerospace or pharma, where you have established business, they have their own R&D facilities, so you license a technology from university and then you build the solution in your labs, right? So the, uh, the Google or the IBM or the, or the Tesla equivalent of energy doesn't exist, right? Especially in the developing country, we don't have any new energy company other than the state-owned utilities or old school generation companies. So you need an incubation model that is willing to provide early stage incubation for a significantly longer period. And then you need investors who are willing to take that long-term risk. Yeah. And even after that you know, long-term risk and patience, uh, you should be willing to accept suboptimal returns when it comes to pure play financial IRR. So do you have that level of uh, commitment from your own LPs uh, that they are willing to live with lower returns despite having a longer term horizon and higher risk. Yeah, so th th this is something just if, if anyone gets one takeaway from this evening, it, 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 it is that what, uh, what uh, Amy and Charlie and Manoj are trying to do is very hard. It's very hard, and 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 we, the the world of instant gratification does not include this. Uh, and and so thank you very much. However, if you yeah. are lucky and, and you figure out a, a you know new battery or or you know more efficient way of storage or more efficient appliance, you might get very early at that well. Absolutely. But yeah. those are outliers or lucky situations. But in general, I see a long-term horizon. Right, right. And, and, and incidentally, you've also mentioned j just to that, uh, you said that you, you have to be willing to accept suboptimal sub financial returns, but the social returns can be very high and together uh, the outcome yeah. is, good, is good. Charlie, let's move to you. Okay. Okay, I, okay I'm really gonna put you on the spot now. Okay. All right. right. All right. <laughs> so, uh, so what, what we want from you, Charlie, we, we want to come down uh, to ground level. What, what's the landscape now, 2018, May 2018? Yeah. Startups, energy startups. So I think uh, it's interesting, you know, in the world of energy startups, um, you can draw a pretty clear line between those that are trying to do something with hardware uh, versus those who are trying to do something with software. And there's probably a lot of different ways that you can bisect the market. But, um, you know, we have definitely picked one of the more difficult things to do in building a piece of hardware and not a small piece of hardware either. This isn't something that straps to a meter outside your house. Uh, this is something that at demonstration unit levels is the size of a 20 foot shipping container. Um, so developing this takes a tremendous amount of capital. Uh, you know, there's been some comments about how the US government isn't necessarily supporting uh, some of that research right now. What's nice is uh, 
in terms of support for that research, it's actually pretty similar to support for Department of Defense work in the sense that there's this huge network of academics and national labs across all 50 states. And so when a new president comes in and says, I want to mess with this money here, this big pot of money, uh, there's actually great support on both sides of the aisle uh, for organizations like ARPA-E. Uh, and ARPA-E is an organization that was put out there specifically geared towards funding technologies and getting them over the first valley of death. Um, somebody mentioned there's multiple valleys of death. That's certainly true. Um, but the first one is, does it work? Uh, how do you get it from a piece of paper into a physical device that you can flip on and actually see it do what it's supposed to do? In terms of finding investors who are interested in eating that risk in a technology, I mean, it's scant. There's not a lot of investors out there that are interested in taking that level of technology risk. When you're looking at the energy sector, there's also not the benefit of the FDA kind of approval process, where it's like, okay, here's checkpoint one, and we've got people who like that risk because they're very comfortable with it. They know how to get it from point A to point B. Here's checkpoint two. You know, that, that doesn't exist in the energy world. It's, you know, hell getting your piece of technology to work, and then it's hell selling it to a utility because the sales cycles are god awful. And if you're gonna go out there and raise a tremendous amount of capital, then you get stuck in, in and what I think is called the growth trap. I don't know if this is something that I made up on my own, but, but it's this idea that you know, traditionally venture capital would sink a lot of money into a company and trying to accelerate the growth as much as possible. The problem is you can accelerate technology development and become technology push, which Manoj just mentioned here, right? If you sink $30 million into a company, you have an expectation of what the value of that company is going to be a certain period of time down the road. Um, so, you sink $30 million into the company, they hire 50 PhDs, they eat all that money, they build a beautiful product, they don't have any sales. So they go back to the well, they get more money from the investors. You keep diluting everybody in here, and then all of a sudden there's nobody who's really interested in seeing the technology uh, survive. It's difficult because you've got eight years of technology development, very meager sales. So you know, what we have done differently as a company is you know, focus on how can we get as much non-diluting capital into our company? Because what that allows you to do is it allows you to discover niches that you're gonna get some product market fit that might not be the whiz-bang moonshot market, but you don't have $30 million of investor money in your company that you have to justify the moonshot valuation. If you can find a product market fit that can get you out there, that can get you to cash flow positive with spending meager amounts of money you have a shot at success, and, and we think a, a higher shot at success. Maybe define non-dilutive. Okay, so non-dilutive is, is the sense that, and, and I Thank shouldn't you, say non-dilutive, <laughs> I, I should say your job. Sorry. Cheap, good. <laughs> cheap capital. Mm -hmm. so, so the idea here is that you don't want to give away much of your company at, in exchange for that money that you're getting in. The places that you find that cheap money is uh, federal through RPE. There's also a lot of states that have vested interests in cleaner technologies or advanced technologies. Um, you have to understand that what states are interested in, in New York, even though they talk about clean technologies, and what states are interested in, in California, uh, or the West Coast, dealing with fires versus dealing with storms and, and hurricanes and you know, blizzards. Like there's, there are all these little unique snowflakes out there. You know? and, and there are these niche markets that you can operate in if you don't take that huge check. Um, so that's something that we feel a little bit differently about. One other comment that I'll make, um, actually I'll make two other quick comments. Uh, a great way to get this done is to find mid-cap companies uh, to work with. If you're working with very large cap companies, you know, they're either hedging or they think that you're going to be you know, a huge hit and they're gonna inject a lot of money into you, bring you on. Um, with mid-cap companies, you know, a base hit, you know, making 20, 30 million dollars in revenue four or five years in, that looks great. You know, they would be, terribly excited to create a new product category in the energy space and be getting that. You know, if you're GE, that doesn't move the needle, you don't care. The other thing that I would say about this is, you know, we've gone through and talked to all the incubators, we've applied to so many different programs. Um, we were very fortunate, we took second place in New Venture Challenge, uh, we took, uh, we got an Innovation Fund Award. Um, so between those two organizations, we got $230,000 worth of very friendly capital into the company. Um, another million and a half through the Department of Energy through RPE. Um, these are the sort of dollar amounts you need to be able to put together. The, the traps here that I see are when you're working with incubators, you have to understand if they're invested in the success of your technology and company or if it is a hedge. 
You do not want to be there so that they can just cover their bases. You don't want to spin your wheels working for this incubator and this company just so they can make sure that you don't disrupt them down the road. Um, you want them working to help you disrupt them, if that makes sense. Um, so that's a dynamic that we see in the, the incubator space as well. Um, and I would say that that's something that you know, a lot of the utilities out there are potentially guilty of because they know things are going to change and they have a feeling that they might change fast, but they don't know what to bet on, so they're going to just lay a lot of little bets and just make sure that they don't get left behind. Yeah, and I'd, I'd like to jump in there too because I think one point to make is how do you work with some of these leaders in the industry, which are heavily regulated. As I mentioned, a lot of the utilities in the space won't be able to really invest or, or invest very heavily um, until they can see a path to recovering the cost for this. So until they can see some favorable decision by their Commerce Commission to recover the cost for some large investment that they might make in this new technology. So they'll, they'll do pilots. And so we have sort of a phrase in the industry which is death by pilot. And they'll run pilots that sort of like barely keep the young companies alive for a period of time, but they don't really lead to a large customer deal. And so what you have to figure out is how do you work with some of the folks that aren't regulated in the industry? And so those might be some of the equipment makers, they might be some of the system integrators, folks that have already a solution. So in the case of say building management, the people that are making all of the control system for buildings, they have a portfolio. They will you know, try things and they'll, they'll experiment and then with the hope of adding that into their portfolio and they don't have to go through um, a, a regulatory process. Um, independent power producers have to compete. So Invenergy is an independent power producer. There are a whole bunch of them in the United States. They have to compete and are much more entrepreneurial and, and scrappy and, and much, more, um, much more in favor of finding innovation and trying that to, be, to win. And so they're going to be supplying power to these utilities in a lot of cases, but their path to doing that is going to encompass a lot more innovation and they're going to be looking for some way to be ahead of the next independent power producer. So you have to find folks that have that appetite for risk and who are not subject to the same amount of regulation. Um, we're, we're talking right now, we're very excited about the drone space. So to give you another example, um, and it's, it's interesting because, you know, what Charlie was saying about hardware versus software, we're not very interested in the drones themselves because the prices have come down so dramatically and the capabilities of these cheaper drones for commercial space are, are very impressive, right? So you can go on Amazon today and buy a drone for $1,200 and you can use a, a an iPhone to fly it over space and that iPhone you know, solution that's from one of these software providers has a great deal of power and it can help you make sense of the images and recommend you know, what to do with it. And so all the innovation is in the applications. It's all in the software, making sense of all those images. It's not in the camera technology, it's not in the drones themselves, it's in the analysis that you need to make the, the images useful. But when we talk to utility companies about this, they said, well, we'll do a pilot, we'll do this, but we're not going to go buy a whole bunch of drones until we know we can get the money back from our commission. So then you have to think, well, how do you come at that? Then you have to maybe, you know, eke along a pilot until they will see enough value and then they're gonna, you're probably going to have to wait a couple of years for them to get a case in front of the commission to get a favorable decision. Um, or maybe you're going to sell it to them as a service you know, where they don't have to make a capital investment. And so you could sell that drone solution as a service to them where they pay for what they use as opposed to investing in a whole bunch of equipment. And then now you're trying to make money on the software and, and sort of the decisions or the value that that drone has captured for them. So I think the models have to be very, very creative. You've got to figure out a way to work with those heavily regulated industries with a unique model that gets around some of those barriers from an investment standpoint. Uh, let's be, be between you two, let's, uh, let's Distributed energy is a big thing. Um, what is it and where is it? Well, I'll talk about the generation side. You want to talk about distributed from maybe the I'll delivery? Yeah. I'll okay. talk about what's left. Okay, good. So rooftop solar. So I, basically all the small scale generation. Rooftop solar, you know, I, I'm not really, we're not very bullish on small scale wind, but some people are using small scale wind. So, so what is distributed energy? Okay, distributed energy is all of the smaller ways to generate power that is not in a centralized place like a big plant, right? So it's, it's, it's maybe, let's call it at the building scale to make it simple. It could be at the community or the neighborhood scale as well, but you're generating power in a small footprint, not in some big centralized plant that makes 
um, you know, a gigawatt of power every day, like a nuclear plant, it's, it's going to maybe make 100 kilowatts of power for a building. And so you're looking at a smaller way to generate power that is not in a centralized solution. That could be solar, that could be small scale wind, that could be batteries that are storing power. You can even look at electric vehicles as part of that distributed solution because they're going to consume power and they're holding that power to, you know, to drive around and I think would be a great solution for developing countries where um, you know, traffic and, and automobile pollution is a big contributor to, um, to some of the social problems in some of the developing countries. So looking at electric vehicles as a, as a clean source but also as a resource. Now you have batteries as a resource on the grid. Maybe covering sort of the generations standpoint. What do you think, Charlie? How else would you go after? Distributed. Yeah, I mean, so I think when you, you consider distributed generation, you're talking about something that's at the distribution level. Um, so if you think about the infrastructure and the picture that you have in the back of your mind, think wood poles as opposed to the big steel lattice towers. Um, so we're talking about systems that operate at 15,000 volts and are that last run of electricity before it gets to your home or office building. Um, this is actually ties in pretty closely to what we do. Uh, so by using our technology, uh, you can increase the amount of distributed generation that you can put on a given circuit. Um, you know, we use an analogy that if you think about traffic 100 years ago when you had cars going and there weren't necessarily traffic lights to help organize which way they should go, uh, you know, there was an issue of efficiency, there was an issue of safety. Uh, we're tackling a similar issue right now. Traditionally, the electrical grid has always been designed in terms of delivering electricity to the end users. We're seeing that challenge with rooftop and distributed generation. When you do that, you need a way to be able to manage those new flows out on the distribution grid. That's what we do. We build a product that specifically addresses that issue. Um, so getting down to the distributed generation side, I think the kind of what's interesting and what we're seeing emerge right now are how can this have an impact on what the distribution utilities traditionally considered um, you know, their core way of making money. Uh, so distribution utilities, they make money by spending money. We talked about the rate base. They justify upgrading a substation and they get to make 10 or 11% on that investment. You know, traditionally this was great, especially when you had decent load growth. Right now we're getting into a cycle. So, so the electrical load in the U.S. has not really grown much at all. Um, this is something Amy, I'm sure, would love to talk about too in terms of the sense of, you know, it's a zero-sum game. You don't just build generators for the sake of building generators. You either have to have generators that age out or you have to have load growth in order to actually need those generators, right? Um, otherwise you're dealing with a bunch of generators that are old and dirty and have amortized all of their costs and can run pretty effectively if the fuel source isn't, isn't too expensive. Um, but getting back to the distribution level, with utilities, what they traditionally said was, okay, we're gonna rebuild this part of the grid. And now what they're being challenged with by their, um, their state level regulators is, well, is there a way that you could hire somebody to make 800 homes more efficient? And then do you still need this upgrade? Or what if we installed two megawatts of solar somewhere on this feeder? You know, these sort of options are called uh, non-wires alternatives. Uh, we're starting to see this crop up. What's interesting about this and what I think you're gonna see really developing in the next few years is how is this regulated? And is this something that the utility actually owns? Because traditionally, I mean, the bread and butter of the utility is gotta be the wires, right? Well, we're looking at things like in Washington DC right now, they're actually, I think, incentivizing this distributed energy like group that's separate from the utilities. And every time the utility wants to spend more than like $25 million, they're going to get challenged by a different administration that's going to come up with these alternative solutions. Like that, I mean, talk about competition and this idea of regulated monopolies, that is definitely turning the utility model on its head. Um, you know, we have a solution that we think is a great non-wires alternative. I won't plug it too much, um, but, but we'd like to fill into that bucket, um, you know, as well. But I think that that's, when you're talking about distributed generation, you're talking about having that generation stack move from the transmission level system out and get smaller and smaller and, um, you know, again, not to, not to rant too much about this, but if you think about a solar panel or a battery, uh, the most efficient way to manufacture a solar panel or a battery, I mean, a solar panel's, you know, a couple meters by a meter. A battery, I mean, we're still using small, what are called 18650 batteries um, for electric vehicles and things like this is a very efficient way. It's not a thousand megawatt natural gas plant that's huge and covers acres, you know, so, when you talk about scale and understanding the manufacturing costs associated with some of these technologies and can they assimilate down to this level, the answer is absolutely yes. They already are. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. So, okay, so the, so the uh, Manoj, do you want to say something? Yeah. yeah. So, so another thing in distributed energy is the business models are 
completely changing and also the financial models, right? So the utility or a micro or mini utility in a local area uh, could be actually selling drinking water and not electricity and using actually energy to purify the water, right? And, and, and you are actually not selling energy, you are actually selling water, hmm. right? So all the new business models will evolve depending upon how, how people consume energy. And there could be multiple uses for those consumptions. So I think increasingly entrepreneurs and innovators need to look at the consumption side of this story, not just the generation side of it, one. And two, it's not about just technology innovation, the financial innovation. For example, you are selling an appliance, right? So people would buy appliance if you are giving probably in, in say 36 installments, right? Look at, look at the cell phone industry. Right uh, in in United States, where telecom operators and cell uh, cell phone manufacturers uh, do the bundle deals, where you buy a three-year plan and you pay a minimum monthly uses. Right, uh, it's it's very popular here, but it's not there in India yet, or in, in many developing countries you won't find it. Uh, but increasingly, what is happening in in telecom would happen in energy. Right, you would have innovations like prepaid models. Right, to take care of uh, non-payment of utility bills, which are very common. Right? So, so innovators who are getting into energy entrepreneurship need to think about those financial innovations as well, and how do you bundle energy in, in appliances business or, or in consumption side of it. Do you think, I'm no. just jump in there, I mean, I wonder if, if markets, and, and I can't say that I know like the reliability metrics, but markets where they haven't traditionally had reliable electricity, are they more receptive to new technologies going out on the grid? Or is the idea, you know, what we see here in the US a lot is, you know, a storm comes through and, you know, knocks out half of New Jersey's power or fires just ravage California. They don't go out there and say like, okay, well, how are we gonna do this right this time? Yeah. Let's use all the, the new technology. They say, how can we prop this thing up as quickly as possible? That's a great question. So, so we, we recently had uh, access to a research where there's a company in India that does rooftop solar, and uh, they shared their last year's number that 75% of their sales were to households who had access to grid. Hmm. So they used it for p quality of power. Right, yeah. so it's a user experience issue. 75% yeah. mm -hmm. of rooftop solar sales to people who have access to grid is it completely validates what, what you're just saying, that people pay premium for access to good quality mm -hmm. energy and they, they, there's an asset ownership element because if I have rooftop, I own the asset, right? So if you can give me a package where I pay you over a period of time and I own this asset, right? I have control on my energy. Mm -hmm. I, think, I think also you, you know, talking about building, kind of propping up this old, you know, structure that we have. I mean, look what we, look at Puerto Rico, right? So in island nations that are so vulnerable to natural disasters, um, they still can't get power on for everyone there. It still goes out repeatedly. And you've got to find a way to make that more resilient and, and sort of like leap ahead. We need some kind of step change in, in the reliability of power in some of these communities. And you know, Charlie's exactly right. Like the system in the United States is pretty unique. It isn't really the right model for the rest of the world. You're not going to build the United States grid in developing countries or island nations. You have to come up with a solution that is more resilient, that is more distributed, and that um, you know has you know, I think better use of technology. Like let's stop putting up the poles and the wires. Like let's figure out how to get, you know make stuff um, more resilient at the building scale. Let's give people you know who are consuming the power a little bit more control, but also an incentive to maybe use it more wisely too. You know we've gotten really spoiled in the United States. Like we expect it to be on all the time, and for it to be not very expensive. So. Um, in places where it is very expensive, like Hawaii and other places, they're actually adopting technologies much more quickly because there's a, there's a greater incentive to get a solution in place that is more cost effective, but also more reliable. Reliability is, is, is more of a premium. And the forecast, is just to pull all this together, the forecast in the United States, or um, uh, the ones that I see anyway, is that uh, is distributed generation. That, that this is the future. Is that, is that Correct? Is that the way you both see it? I, no, I think you'll always have some amount of 
um, power that is you know, supplying a lot of power, right? For, for cities, I think it would be hard to power a city. So like, you know, Chicago is a very good example. You could not build enough distributed power for the density that we have here. So you need to supply some amount of power from, without, from outside the city that comes from a source that's you know, large and, and relatively inexpensive. And then you can use the, the distributed solutions for resiliency, um, but also for people that own those buildings or those businesses to reduce their reliance on, on grid scale power. But you're gonna need, you're definitely gonna need both, which is why you asked me like, what is, what is B, what is the goal? I said 80% reliability, or sorry, 80% clean energy because I know we're gonna have a lot of these invested assets for a long period of time and they're actually gonna serve a really important need in the market because they're, they're, they're gonna be cost effective, they're gonna supply power to highly congested areas where you could not go fully distributed. That actually isn't really practical. These, the, uh, just looping back when you described death by pilot, when, when, when we hear about the, the headline pilot projects out in California, uh, big battery uh, projects, uh, Southern California, Edison, Edison and so on, are these death by pilot? No, they're, they're not all deathly. They're not all mm -hmm. deathly. I mean, I think that it's more of a, a comment to the startup community, you know, where um, like companies like Charlie's, you know, size need validation from some of these incumbent players in order to be able to attract investors, right? So the investors want to see that the solution is viable, uh, practical, and that there's customers there. So the, the, as he said, a lot of the, you know, the utilities are, are slow, they're not leaders, and so what they'll do is they'll pilot test a lot of things, but they won't move to becoming a big customer for those young companies. Um, or what they'll do is they'll pilot a bunch of little things and then they'll go and run an RFP process, a request for proposal process, and then they'll award it to the very large company that they're already working with. So the, the young company gets kind of stuck maybe helping to educate them about a solution and then the large company comes in and wins the contract. So we see that all the time. So that's kind of what I, what I meant there. I mean, pilot projects of technologies, you know, um, electric vehicle pilots, um, yeah, I mean, all that, that can be very successful because it just, it does help to educate. It helps to build like an installed base for a solution and it provides an example for, for other folks to innovate on top of. So it's, it's not all bad. It's, it's more of a, I guess it's more of a, a kick to the utilities that they, um, they, they aren't super uh, intentional. They're not really sort of honest with a lot of their intentions when they run a lot of these programs with young companies. Yeah, I would say pilots are necessary but insufficient, um, if that makes sense. I mean, you never get large scale sales with the utility unless you've done a pilot project with them and it's probably had to run through a summer cycle if not, you know, an entire year. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, as far as going back to the FDA, phase one, phase two, phase three, or, or whatever it might be, I mean, a pilot is a nice discernible point to have um, on your resume as a, as a startup. I mean, you have to get uh, pilot units out there if you want to sell at any scale. I mean, the, the biggest problem has been, what we really saw you know, a lot of pain around this was with energy storage. Um, and energy storage had additional complications because traditionally utilities were split into, you know, energy, distribution, and transmission. And that's how it was kind of built out. And so now you had energy storage which was more of an energy type asset, but they wanted to put it on the wires side of the house, right, for distribution companies. So that was a complete nightmare for a lot of utilities trying to navigate that from a regulatory perspective. Utilities would love to be able to rate base a couple hundred million dollars worth of energy storage. Um, you know, coming back to some of the, the buzzwords that we've used around resiliency, I mean, I go to conferences and it's an entire conference on how to value resiliency. I mean, they, these utilities can't get their arms around this to a point where they can really justify it to a state regulator so that they can rate base a lot of this equipment. Um, so part of that was, I think, regulatory um, hurdles that we saw with that. The other part um, is, you know, batteries are, are a commodity. Um, you know, it's, it's just, there's not a lot of, um, you know, difference in terms of storing energy in a lithium ion cell versus a flow battery, and I know there's somebody from Argonne here who's gonna come down and choke me after the show, <laughs> but, like, but like the truth is, like what matters is you know, a cost per, per kilowatt hour. Um, you know, there's some like charging ratios and stuff that you have to take into account, but if you look at lithium ion, it's always gonna kick the crap out of a flow battery anyways. So anyhow, the, the, the problem you know, that, that I see here is you know, a lot of what we're talking about is like this incremental stuff. So mm -hmm. like 
you know, I think Amy's organization is like, we've got all this tremendous data on our, our assets. You know, Invenergy is a medium-sized utility. We are, you know, you are forward thinking. And so sitting there, you're like, well, how do we take all this information that we have and either lever it into investments that, you know, go through the roof or figure out a way to get more competitive on the IPP side? For a company like ours, you know, there's, there's a couple of ways to attract investors. And you know, doing the incremental side of it is, is one thing. You know, we can make reliability better, uh, but we also have to have a narrative for how we can have a huge impact on um, uh, greenhouse gases and, and climate change. Mm -hmm. And that's because there's not a lot of people that see investment at our stage as a wise investment. A lot of times it's an, a passionate investment. So we see a lot of family offices um, that are more focused on this because you know family office think you know this is legacy money. They're thinking about their grandchildren and thinking about what sort of world they're going to have. They don't have you know eight or ten years where they have to show a return for their LPs. Um, so they're you know eager to get com uh, you know passionate about new technologies. We have seen several organizations that are just out there talking about specific thresholds of CO2 reduction that you have to hit in order to be considered as a potential company. Um, so those are, you know, you have to have your moonshot story if you're, a, if you're a startup and trying to tackle something like that. And you can get enough capital to go and, and ring out some of the technology risk. But I think a lot of what we're talking about here, you've got to think about it. Is this incremental or is this, you know, really fundamentally changing how we consume energy? This is a very valid point, yeah. you know. So what we are trying to do, uh, we did it in healthcare and now we are replicating it in energy as well. Uh, that even before startups like Charlie's, they can access dilutive capital. Even mm -hmm. before that, they need access to prize money, award money, grants, and all that. So we, we, we are creating a platform for aggregating philanthropic capital uh, called India Energy Fund that would initially give some seed grant at the incubation stage, and, and, and then some of the selected uh, you know, uh, startups that reach a particular milestone can compete for seed capital in the form of equity or convertibles. But even before you get access to equity and convertible, you need some amount of grant money, which, uh, you know, you, you need access to, you know, in, in many countries, the state is one of the biggest sponsors of R&D. But that's not true everywhere, right? So you need, uh, you know, public finance or, or taxpayers' money, but you also need philanthropic capital till you are in a situation to reach uh, early stage. And that ecosystem needs to be built if you're building uh, a, a bridge between lab and incubators, then you need a bridge capital in the form of soft capital or philanthropy. Yeah, we, we're lucky we have that here yeah. in Chicago. I mean, Clean Energy Trust was the first yeah. organization you know, established to build that ecosystem, but yeah. also to do that early funding for the things that were spinning yeah. out of the labs and universities, knowing that they they definitely had a period of time where they wouldn't be able to raise venture capital. Yeah. So our fund does B and C stage investing. So we, we scour the incubators around the United States looking for investable yeah. companies. You know, yeah. whether that's here at you know, Clean Energy Trust, they have an event actually later this month. Um, I know they're partnered with, with you guys, right? With, with Epic on this, so uh, next week. It's next week, next Wednesday. They're gonna be showcasing some of their new companies and new investments. Um, Charlie participated last year. Were you in it last yeah, year? Yeah, I was in it last year. But, okay, Emily's but, in the back if you wanna learn more Emily? about There's it. Emily, okay, great. <laughs> um, so yeah, I gotta do my Clean Energy Trust plug. Otherwise, yeah, she would probably come choke me yeah, after the yeah. I think we're all gonna be in uh, <laughs> A lot of choking gonna go on here. Yeah. Um, but no, I think that, you know, Manoj, what you're saying, you've gotta have a group that organizes the ecosystem that takes some of that risk, yeah. that puts that money out there um, so that the investors can come and follow afterwards, but you have to be very scrappy the way that Charlie's company is to get that, that non-dilutive funding, that grant funding, whether it's you know, from the federal government, from the state, or even from your, your university or your lab has some money for that. Um, but, but the impact investors, um, I did want to comment on that because we're excited to see a number of investors uh, that are moving into the space because they can get ESG impact for their money. So environmental, social governance, impact for their money that's in addition to a return. But I will say what we're seeing, at least in the United States, is they do not want to suffer any kind of concession in the returns. They're looking for a market return, plus they want the ESG impact. Oh. So um, I think right. that it's evolving. I mean, I, there certainly are some investors that will, you know, um, have a, a, a lower return expectation, but we're seeing folks moving into 
investments that actually want the market return plus that. And I think that's actually a really, really good sign because um, as that happens, they can kind of prove that that's actually a benefit. The same way that diversity, like we have a saying around our fund that uh, diversity drives alpha. So the same way that diversity drives alpha, whether it's in investments or in business or you know, in a corporation that, you know, I think folks that are doing this kind of investing now believe that ESG yeah. drives alpha in, um, in their investment uh, profile. So we're, we're pretty hopeful. I mean, we're in the early stages of this yeah. and starting to see some of the results from that. Um, but we're definitely seeing, you know, the funds, the vintage 2007, 2010 clean tech venture funds that failed, um, you know, were, are being replaced by strategic money, corporate strategic money, but also this bucket of impact funding, which is, you know, primarily foundations and family offices. The, okay. the, only, the only issue with impact investors is they are looking at distribution play rather than product development. So, so what happens, a large component of impact capital is going at a very late stage. So, you know, if you are building a product, uh, you know, the, the deep, uh, you know, really patient and high risk capital that is required before you can take your solution to market uh, is not coming from the impact investor. It happened in uh, other sectors as well, not only energy, like where impact investors went into financial inclusion, microfinance and supply chains, but you rarely see impact investment in science and technology based innovative startups. Uh, in fact, the mainstream VCs have been more uh, forthcoming to take that kind of the risk. So. I, I think we're, that's start, we're starting to see that change. Yeah. We're starting to see that change. Um, you know, we, I guess I would challenge that, Manoj. We're starting to see that change for sure. I think in the last couple of years, um, I'd say the impact investors, especially as you've had the divestiture movement. So I think, you know, in the beginning stages of this, it was folks that were doing, you know, negative screens, right? So they didn't want their money in things that were bad. They didn't want it in tobacco and they didn't want it in, you know, oil and gas or anything heavily polluting. But then it was like, well, what do you put it into? Okay, so then you're putting it into maybe developing countries or um, that you know areas of investment that where there was a, a very clear social benefit. But I'd say now it's evolving to be, well, well, how do we actually now invest in some of these solutions that have tremendous commercial appeal that um, there isn't enough capital for, and there really still isn't enough capital for energy investing. When when all those VCs sort of dabbled, when all the tourists went away, they weren't you know. A whole bunch of other people didn't rush in. So like the strategics are slowly starting to come back mm. in. I mean, that's why Invenergy created our fund. Um, and we have a number of strategic investors in our fund. Um, but that's just starting to happen now. And, and it's 2018. And you know, that's you know, 10 years after the first wave of clean tech investment right. happened. So it took a while for the strategics to come. I think we'll get another wave in the next you know, five to 10 years of impact investors that are, are, are driving for you know, market-based returns or better but also looking for that kind of solution. We're seeing, actually, we're seeing them across the capital stack. You know, at the early stage, we're seeing them at the venture stage, and then, of course, at the later stage, um, whether it's real assets or, you know, more technology, we're definitely seeing them play across the board. Okay, we're, we're gonna go to the audience in uh, just a second, but before we do, I've been dying to ask you, uh, Manoj, what, one of the big fixed factors in India uh, is coal. Uh, coal mines, there, uh, there's a lot of coal. It's cheap. Um, what's going to happen? W w uh, uh, is India going to use all that coal? I think the coal uses will definitely come down over a period of time. Uh, there, is, there is policy imperative there. But right now, uh, we will continue to use coal. It, it, it serves the energy needs, right? Yeah. Okay, th thanks. So uh, we're going to bring, bring this to the uh, audience. If you have a question, do, do we have microphones, mm -hmm. by the way, around? We do, great. Wait for the microphone, um, identify yourself, really ask a question. <laughs> Here, we'll do this. this I like that. <laughs> That's good. Hi, I'm Mark Templeton. I teach environmental and energy law at the law school. Uh, and so I had a question for you about, uh, since it's 
sponsored by the Energy Policy Institute. Uh, what policy changes would you like to see made? And I ask that also in the sense that it seems like there are a lot of policy changes that have happened, right? You've got renewable energy credits, you've got FERC, which is now opening up energy storage. And, and so uh, I was just wondering, are there other policy innovations you would like, and would that really address the utilities' uh, concerns and pressure on them in terms of reliability, uh, which seems to just be hindering a lot of innovation uh, more generally? Amy, you want to take that? So many policy changes. It's hard to. <laughs> this is your top three. <laughs> um, well, let's go for some big ones. I mean, I think uh, I would. I would really. I mean, what we're, what's happening at least in the United States with renewable energy, fortunately, is this phase out of the incentives, right, for the production tax credit for wind and the investment tax credit for for solar, and now you know looking at expanding that investment tax credit to you know to include potentially include storage. Um, I think that really at this stage, if there was, um, I'm actually gonna, I'm gonna actually gonna, I'm gonna go total counterintuitive and say at, at a national level, if there wasn't actually any kind of, if, you, if, they, if we let the sort of technology sources compete on the market values in their regions and find the best solution for the region based upon the profile that exists already, but also upon the uh, you know the usage and the demand profiles. I think it's best to sort of like let that market play out and find the right solution there. I I one area that I would love to see us really invest in um, would be around electric vehicles. I mean, it kind of breaks my heart that we're talking about you know repealing some of the fuel efficiency targets when we've kind of made we made a lot of progress to move that forward, and now we want to move it backwards for. Why? You know what I mean? Like it kind of. The, I thought a lot of the manufacturers rose to the occasion, and so to move to to pull that back, I'd like to see us lean in forward to to move for a quicker electrification of uh, the vehicle fleet, whether that's you know for passenger vehicles or fleet vehicles. I actually think that will serve a lot of benefits. One is it will clean up the air that combustion engine vehicles contribute you know pollution to but it will also create load. You know, so Charlie talked about the fact that in the United States we have you know, flat to declining energy load. If we could accelerate the proliferation of electric vehicles, it would actually create load. And that actually kind of makes the whole system work better because then all these technologies are not, like they're not sort of crabs in the barrel trying to crawl out. There's actually a, a role for them each to play, right? So there's, there's room for everybody to grow if, the, if energy um, demand and consumption is growing, and electric vehicles could probably want to be the single largest things to create that. Okay. Uh, I want to just broaden this out. Manoj, one policy change in India you would like to see? I would like to see? Yep. Uh, I think on, on, on the investment side, uh, we probably need to have some more incentives for working capital finance. In India, we have huge issues. If, you know, even if you are a startup and you have sorted out your uh, technology innovation and taking it to market, the access to credit is very difficult. So there has to be some incentive either, uh, you know, that, like we have priority sector lending as a concept in India for agriculture and some other areas. It's part of energy also. But I think overall in, in energy space we need uh, we need access to access to capital is it, it continues to be a big issue. So there could be some fiscal incentives for ca capital access. Thank you. Uh, another question. Right here. Do we have a microphone? Kristen Brown, um, with Commonwealth Edison, the beloved utility that we've been talking about. Is it, is it beloved? Coming. Is it? <laughs> <laughs> I might get choked twice. <laughs> and, uh, and choked and, and then stabbed. Yeah, actually yeah. just boots. I was also at ARPA E before, which Charlie gave some accolades to. So I think that gives us, gives us neutral. Um, <laughs> but I actually wanted to piggyback off the last question a little bit because Amy, you're, you're answer was at the federal level, which there's obviously a role for, but I'm curious what, the, what, what each of you in your individual roles sees as your contribution to helping push the state to be 
innovative. I think one of the biggest challenges from the utility level, and, and Amy, you've touched on this, is that the regulation isn't set up to drive the utility to be right. innovative, and right. the hands are tied, in a sense, based on the regulated model. We see new business models arising from DER penetration, but given where you sit now, where you sat before at CET, and then Charlie, your experience with startup companies, how do you see where you sit in the ecosystem as being part of the conversation to push the regulation to a standpoint where the utilities can take on that risk, can push for that innovation, so you don't put a startup company in that kind of growth valley of death, so to speak? I mean, I would throw that right back at you because I would guess that you've got a team of 30 regulation lawyers that are you know, working and, and lobbying for, for regulation at the state level. I mean, in terms of us being able to, to push things around and move the needle, it's, it's, it's zero. Um, you know, what we try to do is we try to operate within the existing rate cases. A lot of this is in the public domain, so we can go and look at what utilities have been able to justify in terms of rate baseable capital expenditures and how they were able to rate base that and come up with a narrative that fits what our technology can do so that they can rate base us in a very similar way. Um, we also know, I mean, like FIJA, the Future Energy Jobs Act was, was here in Illinois. There's a lot of R&D money in that one um, for, uh, for, for working on new projects and doing uh, pilots. So that's something else that's exciting to us. But in terms of us being able to kind of get in there, there's a lot of inertia there. And you know, it's, it's difficult for a startup to, to move the needle there. I'll throw one hopeful one out and then maybe building on my last answer, we just saw in Nevada a decision that allowed the Nevada utility to rate-based um, electric vehicle charging infrastructure. And, and back to my point of like, how do you grow load and how could you actually get more of these, you know, that would, that would help vehicle adoption, right? So if the utilities could recover the cost of that and you know, then they have to you know, install them in smart places where they're needed, but also maybe have incentives for homeowners to install the charging you know, infrastructure at their homes because at least at the sort of consumer level, most people are gonna charge their cars at home or at work. So in, in between, it will be public charging. I think that's not, I mean, that's a great place for the utilities to spend money, but you need to really get that home and work part covered. That was, that's gonna handle like most of what people are gonna use to charge their cars. And then you know, you've got some, some innovative um, pockets of money money coming into the states from this Volkswagen decision that is supposed to be used for public charging um, and fast charging, but if, if the utilities could rate base their, the charging infrastructure, then, then we're gonna go fast. Then we're gonna have a lot of money to spend on this. So the, I think that's, that was a hopeful sign. Okay. Uh, S Sam, does that mean you have a question? I have a question. Okay. I'm, gonna, I'm actually gonna ask a question from uh, the overflow. Great. Where the overflow room. The overflow room. Okay. Uh, this comes from, uh, I, I believe it is Hong Durandal from Green Tech Media. Uh, and he asks, with declining tender PPAs globally, how are IPPs adjusting and remaining competitive to remain profitable? It's very painful. It's really painful, you guys. It's really tough. It's super competitive. Um, yeah, I mean, the. God, what was it, less than two cents a kilowatt for solar and, you know, um, uh, that we saw in the Middle East and, I mean, Mexico, the prices are just so, so low. So, I mean, it's a, it's a crazy time right now. The prices will come back up, okay? So that's a, this is a, a, an artificially low point. Um, it, the prices will come back up um, as folks also invest, you know, beyond sort of utility scale. Like, that, it's a very positive sign of growth for the industry. It's, you know, putting these um, large installments in places like Latin America, in the Middle East, um, where they actually, you know, have some land, they have good, you know, solar assets, they have good, you know, solar and wind assets. Charlie was working in Latin America for um, Invenergy for a while. So, um, so it's really tough. I mean, it's really, really tough. Um, I think looking at sort of having to get innovative around the technologies too. So how do you build microgrids? I know Manoj is a little down on, on microgrids from India, but I'm in some of that. these places where you, you know, looking for resiliency so you can build that where that's worth more, where there's some, a, a, as part of the whole solution, that there is high quality power for, you know, certain neighborhoods or also um, where people are willing to invest in that, like at the, you know, commercial industrial scale. So um, I remember this story, there's a company that was doing um, gas powered uh, microgrids and when the Hurricane Harvey hit in Houston, 
uh, and that powers out, you guys remember, for days. And a big issue there was you couldn't even truck gas in, right? So they had piped gas. They were building sort of piped microgrids, and they kept all their customers. They had like a dozen customers, and they kept them all online. So, so there you're sort of looking at what are some innovative solutions that you know, maybe have higher quality, that have higher premiums, that some of the IPPs are going to have to move into. Um, because just this large utility scale, even renewables, is just unsustainable at these low prices. Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in there sure. with just, yep. ju just a, a few quick thoughts on yep. that too, just because um, you know, we've, we've seen even the OEMs are getting hit on this really hard. It's, it's not just the IPPs, it's everybody in the value chain. Um, and the way that you see this is you know, big name companies, um, these might not be big names for everybody in the room, but like you know, Parker Hannafin, uh, SNC Electric, companies that make solar inverters, have just completely disappeared in the US. Uh, everybody who's, who's a part of these projects is getting squeezed out. Yeah. It's rough. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, what I think when, you know, as a startup, one of the things you have to convince somebody of is that you're not gonna become part of that commodity stack where you just get squeezed and squeezed and squeezed. You have to have something that you're doing differently. Okay, okay. Sam, is there, uh, do you have another? Uh, I might ask a question of my own. Okay. Uh, since I have the microphone. Uh, look, I, it seems like, uh, it, we're operating in a suboptimal environment uh, in, in a lot of these cases. Like if, if, uh, if we didn't have other policy goals or other desired outcomes, you might just say, well, you know, we have lots of coal, it's super cheap, let's just burn that forever. Uh, but we have these other, you know, these other things we're trying to solve for related to climate change and just conventional air pollution. And the way that we've dealt with that in a lot of cases so far is uh, through this patchwork of policies, as opposed to like a comprehensive policy. We're in the economics building, so I'll, I can't believe you made it this far without asking about a carbon tax <laughs> or mentioning a carbon tax. A tax. So we don't have that kind of comprehensive policy, so instead we've taken this kind of patchwork approach. And it feels like that's been going on for, like it just first got started maybe 15, 20 years ago as it relates to climate. Um, and I know that, uh, like Amy, you've been involved in this business uh, for that long. And you've seen kind of the, the, the development of this ecosystem that you guys keep talking about uh, that's really cropped up to try to, uh, to drive innovation in the energy space in the absence of a comprehensive policy. Uh, and you, you guys have kind of danced around this, but I guess I would just ask, like, uh, is that, what's, how is the health of that ecosystem today compared to how it was 10 years ago? And is it, uh, is it sufficient or not? And I was very encouraged to hear you say, for example, that, um, that you see people who are, who are actually investing based on return now as opposed to the you know, corporate social responsibility or whatever. Uh, but so how is the health of that ecosystem? And uh, as you guys are participants in that ecosystem, what kinds of companies are you gonna be looking for? What, what kinds of companies do you guys mm -hmm. look to invest in? What opportunities are you seeing? At Minoj in India, you know, what, uh, as you guys get ready to launch this incubator, what kinds of companies are you trying to, to pull in? Okay, okay, hang on just a, so we have a few minutes left. Each per, let's just run straight down. Uh, lightning round, two minutes e each, answer every one of Sam's questions. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just pick and choose from that, <laughs> what I can. Uh, we, we just uh, started this year with our Social Alpha Energy Challenge, which we launched in March, closed end of April. I'm very pleased to say that we, we got about 130 applications which are going through the evaluation now. And they are across huge cases, right? Uh, household, industry, agriculture, farm, you know, everything. And, 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 and we, we would be announcing results next month and then we're going to incubate 10 to 15 companies out of this. Uh, so all of these are going to be creating innovative solutions, having basically three uh, pillars, affordability, accessibility, and user experience, right? How does the consumer experience energy? Uh, is it accessible, right? Through whichever use case, and of course the affordability issue. And then we'll see as we incubate these for next uh, year or two years, when and how they need what type of capital. And interestingly, uh, uh, I got a feedback day before yesterday that there are about 15 applications from outside India from innovators who want to build energy companies in India, So, which is, which is very encouraging. Um, I'll pass to, to Amy. I'll let you uh, jump in. 
just just crush this question. Come on, come on, that's little. dude. Yeah, you're on the spot. I'm, <laughs> I mean, I'll throw some personal opinions at this. You mentioned a carbon tax. Um, I don't know this. I get frustrated whenever I hear that because it always reminds me of um, you know big utilities trying to justify nuclear power plants that might not be cost competitive right now. Um, that's painful for me to hear. Everybody wants to talk about competition until they're not com you know, competitive. Uh, that is probably the biggest pain point that I have you know, in, in the line of questions that, that you gave there. But that's my personal opinion. I mean, if it were really up to me, I would let uh, utilities rate base you know, a megawatt of solar for every circuit that they have out there. I mean, if you really want to have an impact, let's just go and do it tomorrow. You know, I mean, this, this stuff is not brain surgery putting it together. Um, you know, let's just provide the right incentives for them to be able to rate base what they need to to move the needle on the things we care about. Amy, you have the last word. Well, I, okay, so I, I think that young people are the future, okay? So I, I, what I think about is um, I love sort of the, the movement that we have in, in the U.S. around you know, students and young people, and I think a lot of um, what I'm hopeful about is that we can keep alive these great entrepreneurs, you know, sources of innovation long enough so that we can have a generational change in our political leadership so that we can do some things that really represent the future and where people want to go. And I think we're not too far off from that. Um, and so the one little example I'll bring that back to when, uh, when Sam mentioned the ecosystem, um, I guess one hopeful thing is that Clean Energy Trust started in 2009. It's still around, so it's you know, nine years later. Um, their money that they're putting out, so the way it works is their capital goes out in the form of convertible notes and then comes back into the organization and it's starting to recycle but it's taken us nine years to figure out how to do that. And they had their first um, uh, sort of successful exit, which was about a 3x return, and it was from a student team. Okay, so I just, I'm very hopeful about young people and students, and I really think that we just have to keep, you know, they want this future, this clean future. We have to keep inspiring them, keep motivating them, keep companies like Charlie's alive so he can, you know, keep doing what he's doing and, and that sort and of And Manoj alive. And Manoj alive. <laughs> Manoj, he's, yeah, exactly. Like, keep all of the innovation in India alive so that we can solve this problem at a, at a very large scale. But I, I think we're, you know, we're less than a generation away from doing that in a very meaningful way. And I just, I want to be part of that solution. Great. Thanks. Uh, Sam, do you want to close us out? Yeah, I will, yeah. uh, just, uh, so please join me in thanking uh, Steve and our panelists for a fantastic conversation. Thank you.